All right, this is episode 40, guys, of the Homestead Shop Talk podcast with Al from Lemon Acres, Ben from Holler Homestead, and myself, Jason, from So the Land. Also, we've uh, we've hit just over 12,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. How quick, cool. how quick that happened. So how have you guys been? Good. Yeah, pretty good. Guys Busy been? time of year. Yeah, so we, we do have a topic today. Topic, you know, we're going to talk about our week, but... Al just texted us a minute ago this topic. Well, this afternoon. Why? why? <laughs> this just came up in your mind, Al? Like yeah, while you were doing fencing? I was up doing fencing. I just, it came to me. <laughs> so here's the topic. Do, does the future of feeding the U.S. need small farmers and ranchers to do that? And, uh, you know, we'll talk, we'll talk about that after we talk about what we did this week. So I got good news, guys. Um, well, get good, I guess it's good news. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. Today was the, my eighth year anniversary of leaving my office job. <laughs> and, Congratulations. Wow. And also, yeah, congrats. the first time I realized, well, I, I have calluses on my hands now. <laughs> <laughs> I had some pretty soft hands when I left the office. That's I funny. think doing doing this fencing got me really. Uh, I have some like ca- actually calluses. Like it's actually rough. Just have you been like that. spinning your wire by your by hand, or have you have, have you by the little tool that like spins it? It makes it easier on your fingers. No, I have not bought. I have not bought the tool. No. Oh, I did. <laughs> and my fingers appreciate it. <laughs> oh, I know. I keep on every time I handle it. I'm like, I should just go buy that tool. But I. Yeah, I haven't done it. I think because part of my fencing's there already, so it's like kind of already up. I mean, I have to like stretch it a little bit, but I mean, as far as the high tensile stuff is what I'm talking about. Yep. But so I guess weird question: How long have you been cancer free for then? Because that's kind of what started you on this, right? Uh, since 2010. So what is that? Oh wow. 14 15? years. Wow, 14, 14 years. 14 years. Yeah. That's awesome. I think it took took us a good six years, I think, and then we moved. Let me, let me ask you this real quick: Does it feel like it flew by? Because we we're right now we're at five years that we've been here, and it feels like we just got here. Like it, we left we left California six years ago this spring, and like it feels like we left last year. Like it's crazy. Yeah, it do, yeah, it does. It doesn't. It doesn't. I mean. I think maybe a lot has happened, you know, in eight years. And, uh, but yeah, if you look back, you're like, man, what happened for sure? I mean, it does, it does feel like time is flying by at the time. You're like, man, I don't know what's going to, you know, <laughs> there's so many un- uncertainty and what ifs and, you know, scared out of my mind and, and <laughs> not sure what was going to happen. And, and all of a sudden it's eight years, you know? And, uh, when you look back, it, it seems like a lot happened. A lot has happened, but um, it also seems fast. Yeah. So you wonder, like, at the next eight years, how, what is that going to be like? Like, that's going to be warp speed. <laughs> that uh, that country song in my next thirty years. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's almost going to be ten years, which is going to be crazy. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. <laughs> so what's up, Al? You want to go? F- you want to share what you did this week first? I did a lot of fencing, did a lot you? of driving fence post fencing. What kind of fencing? We're doing like high tensile strength kind of sort of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got an electric electric put a, put electricity to it. Keep them. We got three strands for this area. I'm working on the different gates, and then we got a big snowstorm this weekend. We got nice. like, I'm gonna say. At least 15 inches, if not 20 inches of snow. Wow. In like 24 hours. Yeah. We haven't had this much snow all winter. So we had a bunch of small snowstorms, lost all the small, lost all the snow. We, it was, I don't know, two weeks ago, week and a half ago now. We had like a 60 degree day. Then we had rain and it cooled off. And then it was warm during the week. And then, yeah, Friday, it was beautiful. Friday night, it started snowing. And by the end of the, wow night saturday say like midnight we had all the snow so we got to plow and all weekend long 
I will say, luckily, there's one section of fence where it's like in the rocks. And I said to Gina, it was Saturday morning. I'm like, we need to go put this up today in the snowstorm because if, it's not going to be fun in the snowstorm. But it's going to be even worse trying to do it in a foot of snow. <laughs> so look, we got it done. But we're out there today doing all the stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I'm glad we already got that other section done. But, but. Are you just doing T-posts? Yeah, we did T-posts. And then we used, they're called wedge locks. So you can use... Mm another T post to lock in and make your corner bracing. And you're like, I don't want to say H bracing, but your diagonal bracing for your gates and stuff. Is this going to be a pretty permanent fence? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of rocks. So we've done kind of like the big post that you did at our other property. And it was, we hired that out and the guy gave us a quote. He did it for his quote, but I don't think he was happy (laughs) because it (laughs) took him so much time. And I'm like, I watched a professional do it, and he had a te- he had a big pounder for a wood post. He just had it on the back of his tractor, and yeah. he would just pound the posts in the ground. And he had it took him, I think, two or three weeks. I wish I could remember how many. I think it was probably three sections of three hundred and thirty foot woven wire that he put together, and then I'm trying to think five or six gates. But yeah, it was a. It, it was by pretty, himself. Yeah, he was by himself. It was about an acre, I would say, roughly, that we had fenced in. Wow. It took him, it took Andy him had a machine. Andy had a machine. Yep. Man, I don't feel so bad. No, <laughs> I watched him do it, and I said, if I had nice soil, I would love to do fencing like that again. But yeah, after watching him go through what he went through, I'm like, nope. Unfortunately, where we live, it's T-post, because at least that, you're just pounding them in, and you can move them pretty easily. Did but, you ever get a gas-powered pounder? I have not. How do you like that? I love it. It works. How heavy is it? Mm, It's pretty heavy. I mean, you could lift it up with one hand. I mean, it's tough with one hand to lift it up. Yeah. But, you know, it's not too bad. Do you think it takes more effort to hold that or more effort to slam the T-post in without without that? Oh, I'm just, what's that? I would say slam the T-post in. Because you're like this. Yep. There you can just hold it up. And then you just press a button, and it goes all the way down. Until you hit a rock. Until you hit a rock, yeah. Yeah, there's no way around that. <laughs> no. I want, like, a little mini uh, well drilling rig that I can just go around and, like, drill the ground out first. So if I hit a rock, I can just bore right through it. I don't know if anything, <laughs> anything like that exists, but that'd be perfect for New England. <laughs> I've been seeing a functional medicine doctor. I don't know mm-hmm. if you guys have ever heard of that. Mm-hmm. We had one that yep. opened up in our town, so that's been kind of fun doing that, getting the blood work done and seeing yep. my, I need to detox my liver and my vitamin D was down, which is crazy because I take, I was taking 3,000 IOUs, whatever it is, of vitamin D a day. Wow. Yeah. And I've been doing that for years because it's up here in the north where we are, we get, you know, maybe two or three hours worth of sunlight a day. So I've been taking 3,000 a day and then he upped me to 5,000. So I've been doing, I did that for a couple of months now. So we just, I just got my blood work checked this week. So we'll check that again. Vitamin D levels and a few other things. Nothing major, but kind of, it'll be interesting to see the changes and stuff like that. Yeah, that's funny. I just saw a doctor this week too. I'm supposed to get just a checkup. Yep. Uh, I'm supposed to get some blood work done in the next couple of weeks. But... Regular doctor, functional medicine, or? Uh, I would say. He's kind of both. <laughs> yep. He's pretty open to stuff, so just different alternatives and um, just to try them out. Yep. But just to check up, really. I guess you can get your prostate checked nowadays by blood work and not with yep. the old finger. So I was like, yes. <laughs> let's get that. <laughs> I've never had it done. So I don't know how I lucked out, but when I did the police academy, there, you, I, we had to do like a thorough physical and the doctor never did that part for me. And then one of the guys I was going to the academy with, he was talking about and he was like, yeah, I had to get my, and he's like, I'm like, he's like, I had to get my prostate checked. He's like, I'm like, you did? I didn't. He's like, what? He's like, what's <laughs> on there? And they're supposed to. I'm like, I don't know what happened. Mine never got checked. <laughs> oh my gosh. Nice. So, I know. I'm like, yep, yeah, we'll do it by blood work. Yeah. Let's do that yeah. first and see what happens. Right. <laughs> I know. I guess, yeah, I guess we're coming to that age, right? Right. It's just kind of, kind of weird to think about too. 
that yeah it goes with the time flies you know or next yep. thing you know you're checking your prostate <laughs> <laughs> i remember my dad talking about that and you know when he was you know up in his early 40s i think was when that conversation started happening it was like man that's like a million years away for me and then yeah it's getting pretty close it's like man yeah time flies I just know. get your blood work checked that's what they that's the way they can do it now yeah don't let them trick you right. <laughs> <laughs> hey wait a minute i thought my i thought it was supposed to be just blood work no <laughs> I'm, so glad you say, would, I'm glad none of the kids are in the room right now. They would be so <laughs> awkward. <laughs> Part of life. They got to get is. prepared for it. Did you ever say what animal you're getting now? Nope, not yet. Okay. A couple more weeks. All right. Yeah, a couple more weeks. The dog's doing good. We've been training our guardian livestock dog. He's been doing really good. So we got to get him trained up. Cool. No, no dead chickens. You didn't kill any chickens. No, he hasn't yeah. killed any chickens. They're in the big snowstorm. It was easier for him to get them and chase, like to chase them and like get them down. But he didn't kill any. Yeah. He did that two different times. But the chickens can't get away with the foot foot and a half of snow. So and that was my week in a nutshell. What have you guys been up to? Probably enjoying like the seventy degree weather down there. <laughs> yeah. Although, yeah. although it's again, it was cold, right, Ben? Like last couple nights. Yeah, we had some, it was like last Monday, Tuesday, something like that. It was, it was cold because I had to go out there and cover fruit trees again. And then uh, this morning was cold. Yesterday morning was cold. Not super cold, like just a light frost. Uh, but it's still, it's kind of a hassle. You know, we got stuff planted already. So mm -hmm. Either get cold and stay cold for a little bit longer or just be done with it. I know. It likes to tease us all the time. Over here, wreaks havoc on all the on all the fruit trees. They uh they have some of those. You know, I, we had a day what a week and a half ago that got up to eighty, like it was wonderful. And all of a sudden, now we're back down to what was the high today? Like sixty something. It's nice. It's like you don't really have to wear a jacket or anything, but still, it's kind of a hassle because you know <laughs> you're gonna have to go cover everything up. I know. Are fruit trees starting to blossom? Actually, most of them are done um, at this point. Wow. Like all, all of the, uh, I would say the first flush, like the peach. The, uh, let's see. Let me think of what I've been covering up for the past couple of weeks. All of the peach trees, the nectarine trees, those are all done. Um, except for my ones that are up in the woods. Those ones, uh, they're like two or three weeks behind. They are just now starting to bloom. I guess it's a different microclimate up there. Um, and I noticed it looks like the apple trees are getting ready to bloom. Like I'm starting to see some some buds starting and starting to open up on the apple trees. So I assume those will be next. Um, I I know there's a pear tree out in the orchard that's starting to starting to open its little flowers. I'm starting to see some white down there in the orchard now. It's just been hot pink for the past couple of weeks. So yeah, it's rolling. It's rolling. Spring is definitely here. So what'd you get into, Ben, this week? Yeah, you know, like that's. Such a hard question when I have weeks like this, like the bipolar weather that we've got where it's like hot, then cold, and then wet, and then dry. Last week, I actually got a couple days in a row where I got to work on the footing that I'm currently digging. Um, I'm trying to get the footing in so I can get the inspection so I can pour concrete. And I don't know, it's a combination of like, I need to just stay put and get it done. Uh, we keep are going places, doing things, you know, not, not like big, crazy things, but running errands, you know how it is. You just nickel and dime your time to death until you don't get anything done. Uh, it seems like that's the phase that we're currently in. So yeah, I had a couple days to work on the, the footer footers. It's basically a big trench and I'm working on forming everything up. Um, got a good chunk of it. I'm about halfway done. I still have to do rebar and stuff like that, but I'm about halfway done forming everything up. Uh, and then in the meantime, like we've got a whole bunch of potatoes in the ground. Um, I'm trying potatoes in the greenhouse um, because I know we're going to have a whole bunch of, you know, on again, off again, kind of frosty weather. Uh, usually every year, if I get my potatoes in, 
about the time they pop up, we'll have a real hard frost and it wipes them out, takes them back to the ground. Usually they'll regrow from that, but it just kind of slows them down. And so I've got the, the big patch out in the yard. It's our big potato patch. And it was, it was all green. Like it looked real good. And then we had a frost last week and it just wiped everything out. And so we stuck some potatoes in the greenhouse and all of them are starting to come up and we've had a couple frosts and they've survived it. It doesn't even look like they've noticed it. So, you know, fingers crossed if it works out, I think the potatoes in the greenhouse will come out uh, pretty close to the time that tomatoes need to go in. I know you're not supposed to plant your tomatoes and your potatoes next to each other or in the same spot, but Tomatoes will be on the opposite side of the greenhouse from the potatoes, so it should be all right. I guess the only way we would, like, not plant tomatoes in there is if we got blight. Like, if we got blight, like, we're not planting any nightshades in there for, like, it's like five years or something like that. That would be detrimental. Wow. Like, I'd pro- I would probably move the greenhouse if we got blight inside the greenhouse. Right. So, uh, let's see, what else? We planted a whole bunch of, like, root crops and stuff like that last week. You know, Meg, <laughs> Meg is like, she's, she's in the last like month of her pregnancy. And so she's starting to like, I'm seeing like interesting behavior. I think they call it nesting. And so like, I came in here the other day and she's got a toothbrush and she's scrubbing the grout on the backsplash. And it was like, that is not normal behavior. You must be <laughs> nesting. You must be like, a, you know, four or five weeks out. Uh, there's something else she did. She's, she's got the spring bug this year. I don't necessarily have the spring planting itch this year, but she does. And so she went out, she planted a whole bunch of beets, a whole bunch of carrots and stuff like that. And it's, I'm glad that at least one of us is, uh, having the spring fever. Cause I feel like I'm like, one. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm dropping the ball on getting stuff in the ground. I, uh, I murdered our peppers. I had a whole flat of peppers, all of our peppers for the year that we were going to grow. The majority of them were up and they're, I don't know, an inch to two inches tall. And I left them sitting outside on the table and forgot about them. I got up the next morning on my way out to, you know, I've been uh, trying using a pump sprayer to spray the the blooms on the trees because supposedly that will you know, stop the, the blooms from freezing off. And on my way out the door, I like my eyes just focused straight in front of me. And I saw the pepper sitting there. I was like, Oh no, I go walking over there. And they, I mean, it looks like someone took a blowtorch to them. They were already mush. So I've got to replant all of our peppers. We're, uh, kind of, kind of cutting it close. Cause peppers take so long. Uh, yeah. At, at this point, if I can get them replanted and sprouted in, in the ground on time, It'll be it'll be cutting close because usually we don't we don't get to start eating peppers until late July into August. So, I mean, it's not it's the hottest not unheard of. <laughs> yeah, that's the hottest. So I don't know. Yeah, but but they, minor setback. Were they hot peppers? I'm assuming knowing you. They weren't just doing peppers. <laughs> it actually, it was everything. It was our bell peppers, our sweet peppers, oh. our hot peppers. Like it was everything. <laughs> A year, all years worth of peppers. I did have like there was one jalapeno that was in there that was bigger than all the rest and it survived. Like everything else turned to mush and there's just one and it's just like sitting there like yeah. So <laughs> that one's been up potted and that one's uh, in the safety of our uh, our little seed starting area in the bathroom. Uh but yeah, all the rest of them ate it. So <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to think. Oh, I moved the pigs today. Uh, I am like so not in the right mental space right now. And I've been going to move the pigs, you know, at least weekly, biweekly, something like that. They've been there for like a month and a half. They've worn their spot down to the ground. And I was out there watering them yesterday. And it was like, I got to move them. This is this is pathetic. Like, there's nothing for him to eat, nothing for him to do. It's just mud. So, I mean, the boys got out there this morning and got them all moved on the ground they have never been on. Uh, there's there's like an area that I I would love to run them on because there's kutsu growing. 
but I'm kind of wary because I know our neighbors like to shoot their guns. Um, and I'm pretty sure that corner of our woods is where they like to target shoot. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really put the pigs back in that area, even though I think the pigs would be fine because our property's way downhill from that corner of the property. But yeah, I, I kind of haven't put the pigs in that part just, just because of that. So I don't know. We'll, we'll try it out if, if they uh, decide to go target shooting. Maybe I'll just move the pigs the opposite direction. How many pigs do you have right now, Ben? I think at last count, I have 18 of them. I have 13, oh. 13 babies. Uh, actually, in today's video, I talked about it. We've got eight of them that we're ready to sell. Um, and we've got the, I think we're keeping five of them for us. Um, I've got this coming year's pair that we're uh, planning on eating this, this coming fall. So yeah, two feeders. Well, I guess they're two Guinea hog, uh, borrows is what they're called. Um, I've got the three breeders and then 13 babies. It's a lot of mouths to feed. How old are the babies? I'm trying to think, uh, they're like eight months, I think. Okay. So your, are your breeders bred? Yeah. The breeders are bred. Yeah. They're starting to show pretty good. I think they're due in June. I'd have to look at okay. a calendar. Uh, I I think this time it's not going to be within days of each other. Uh, there was a runt that I left with one of the moms to try to get a little bit of weight on it. Uh, and so because one of the moms was nursing where, you know, I weaned the rest of them. Uh, it kind of put the the two females out of out of sync with each other, and so you know by the time I'd left, I think I left the the runt with the mom another probably month, and so when I finally pulled that runt and weaned that one too, uh, the moms were completely out of sync. They used to be on exactly the same cycle, so it made keeping track of breeding like really really easy, but. Now I think they're about three weeks off. So it looks like we'll have piglets and three weeks later we'll have more piglets. And that's not a big deal. But if you have all of your piglets in the same pen, the first batch will make runts out of the second batch. So that means wow. I have to separate the moms when they farrow. Otherwise, the first batch will uh, ruin the chances that the second batch is any good. Other than that, I think that's that's... That's my week in a nutshell, getting kind of caught up. I, I I really have to, like with everything going on right now, I feel like I need to like take notes anytime I do anything. Like, okay, here's Monday. Uh, this is what I did for Monday. Here's Tuesday. That's, that's where I'm at right now. It's like, don't ask me which days I did what. I don't even know. It's like a blur right now. <laughs> Not in that order, but yeah. that's what you did. <laughs> so yeah, we're, so we're, uh, we're still on baby piglet watch with our Cooney. She was supposed to have piglets yesterday, according to our calculation, but it didn't happen. So, I mean, she's looking pretty big right now. She, she's looking ready to go to to me, but um, I don't know. She's uh, maybe any day. I'm hoping I just wake up in the morning and they're already born. Right. Uh, because I know what's gonna, you know, if she does it during the day, I'd be like a nervous wreck. Staring <laughs> <laughs> and watching. Yeah. Hey. I mean, luckily the weather is going to be decent, although I think it's supposed to rain maybe in the next couple of days. So that's when it'll happen if there's a storm. Yeah. I don't think it's supposed to be super cold at least. At least it's not like that. But yeah, we're still waiting. So I finally put out the video for the high tunnel we put on that plastic. Um, I think that was like over a week ago we did that. And then I recently got 35 yards of soil. That's a um, bunch. Mm -hmm. And so to move it, I was like, okay, a wheelbarrow, mini truck, <laughs> <laughs> shovel. <laughs> uh, it's probably like a good, maybe a hundred, maybe 200 feet to the high tunnel where they dumped it. 
Uh, so I decided to rent one of those dingoes. You ever seen those? It's a mini skid steer that you stand behind. You stand up on it, and then it just you, it like takes you. You you don't walk with it. It's like a platform, and you and it drives you. Um, and there's a bucket in the front. Um, those are it's fun. like a little tank. They're pretty fun. They're pretty fun. To, well, first hour is pretty fun, and then after that, <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's just like monotonous. Like mm. you know, just put on the headphones and just zone out um but we did we did all of it, it you know if we rented it if i at the local rental place if you rent it on a saturday saturday morning you have it an extra day because they're closed on sunday uh so it's like you know two for one kind of um so i definitely needed the extra day because you know i probably had it the half day the first day then a full day the second day and we got all that done man we moved it we moved all that soil to the high tunnel. Um, I would say it was about five hours each day of running that thing. Uh, Cause it's not the fastest thing and it's not the biggest thing. <laughs> so uh, I kind of under- underestimated that, but, but honestly, like I was going to rent a skid steer and it would have been double of what this was plus and added $150 to deliver it. So, you know, of course it would have been faster, but it would have been another 150 bucks to deliver it because I couldn't pick it up, you know? I couldn't go uh, load it up. Um, So, you know, I'm glad I I did this at least. It was faster than a wheelbarrow. Did you keep track of how many bucketfuls it took? I did not. I think at one time, I think at one time I was counting and I was, <laughs> you cannot help but count. Right. Um, <laughs> here's one, two. Yeah. Mm. So plus, plus videoing the whole thing, you know, filmed it. Yeah. So how many times you moved the camera? <laughs> yeah. That, that alone like took time right. and you know, that's going to be all time-lapse video. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, I was surprised though. Like I was just planning to move the soil to the high tunnel, and then there's a big garden right next to it. Just just put piles, you know, and then we'll come back another following week or whatever. But the girls were out there, man. Like it was just uh, Penelope and Lorraine and myself, and we were just going back and forth. We look, you know, I dumped that thing, that little dingo bucket raised just enough to dump it in back of my mini truck. It's uh, it would be like five loads in back of my mini truck, and then they would drive it, or Penelope would drive it, and then uh, they would shovel it all out, and then I would use the the dingo. But we were able to do all the hilled rows in the high tunnel at the same time. So, which I was I was so surprised by that because I was like, man, we're we're already done with that. Next, you need to get the dump body kit and make your mini truck into a dump body. I know. (laughs) <laughs> I did think about that. I was like, dang it, I should have got the dump. <laughs> well you can you can you can buy the accessory and upgrade yours. You, you I've never done this, it. But you, you can, can use the it. same the same bed. Yep. Like my mini truck's got a dump body on it and it's just the regular bed with a piston in it. Really? And I don't know if it's mo- the one that we have is electric hydraulic off of the motor, but I don't know if they have one that you can just run off of. Like an electric mm. pump off of a battery. Yeah, that would be cool. That would that would have been helpful for sure. Um, but you know, I'm glad we, glad we got that done. And then the day I took back that machine, of my friend who has a farm down the road, he's like, he called me up in the this. It was actually this morning. So I took the machine back this morning, and then um, my friend calls me up this morning. He's like, hey, first thing he said to me was, hey, you want some wood chips? <laughs> 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 I'm like, what? Like, you hardly ever call me. And then uh, the first thing you tell on the phone, like, you want some wood chips? I was like, yeah. He's like, well, there's a guy that he's going to, he was going to drop wood chips here at my place. But I was like, you know what? There's another guy that I know that he would need it more than me. So I thought that was a good friend right there. uh, Yeah. And I was like, he's like, call this guy up. And so he gave me his number. And an hour later, he dumped my first load of wood chips. Nice. So kind of excited about that. But I was like, man, it's I like just took gold. it back to the machine. I know. <laughs> yeah, because honestly, if I would have had a pile of wood chips 
and I had to move that soil, I would have definitely probably went with the skid steer because this little dingo was great, but you know, it's like a little, I was like, okay, so we have a mini truck. I have a little skid steer. I have, we have little mini pigs. Uh, we're a small family. Um, <laughs> the mini homestead. I know the mini homestead. It's kind of funny, but I would say you should have borrowed my tractor, but I don't have a tractor right now. What Uh-oh. happened to it? Uh, it quit on me. It's been in the shop for, this is the third week now. Oh, really? Yeah. Did they say what was happened? What happened to it? Nope. I called him Friday and, uh, you know, it's like, Hey, you guys have had it for two weeks now and you haven't called me. Mm. And so I checked up with them and they're like, well, like it's in the shop now. Like they took the invoice, they pulled it in. We just, you know, it's Friday. So we'll, we'll let you know next week. I haven't heard from them yeah. today either, but uh, mm. I mean, it's it's a new tractor. This is warranty work. Yeah, so I guess I should just say what happened. I was ripping uh, the uh, the concrete that we had put in that we had to take out. I was taking all that stuff out. I used the tractor for like two hours that morning and it worked fine. Well, literally the last two pieces of concrete, I was hauling them down. I have a spot. I'm sticking them. The tractor starts sputtering. It's done this to me like twice in the, you know, almost two years now that I've had it where it just like all of a sudden loses power and I'll have to like take it out of gear and just sit for a second and it quits sputtering and starts working fine. Well, this time it did it so bad, like there is no power. I can't even put it in granny gear and move without it trying to die. Well, it it dies. Like I'm out in the woods and the tractor's dead and I can't get it started. It's just like, are you kidding me? This is how this is how Monday's going to go. <laughs> so I finally was able to get it started. I got it out of the woods. And as I'm like, I'm just trying to get it somewhere where I can get to it with the truck and the trailer. Uh, cause right now I'm on the other side of the Creek, like it's going to be a mess. So I got it across the Creek. It died again and I just turned it off. I noticed that the oil pressure light came on. So like I, I got it to somewhat level ground and I checked everything. Like it's got oil. It's got all the fluids. Everything's, everything's perfect. <clears throat> I was like, uh Oh, this sounds bad. So I, uh, I just left it sitting there. I called the dealer and told them what was going on. And they're like, don't drive it. Don't even turn it on. Don't do anything with it. If you can get it down here, get it down here. I was like, bummer. That's never something you want to hear. So, yeah, I've been without yeah. a tractor for oh, man. almost three weeks now. They get a pretty good warranty on them, don't they? Like a six-year bumper to bumper? Yep. Or something? Yeah. Uh, the bumper to bumper is only for a year, but the powertrain's for six years. So okay. Okay. I still got four more years on the powertrain. Well, that's good. I, I am going to talk to them when I go to pick it up about maybe trading up. I need something mm. a little bit bigger. Maybe they got everything. <laughs> maybe. That's the push. <laughs> you have a coyote, right? Yeah. 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 I was, I was looking at the, uh, the coyote skid steers and those are, those are pretty stinking nice. I think uh, they just came out with those this year. Uh, I think it, either last year or this year, uh, yeah. I know I've I've been looking at them for a minute, but yeah, I don't know if I can swing that though. Like sixty five thousand dollars for a tractor's that's pretty steep. Plus all those implements, I bet you the implements are more expensive too. Yep. Have you ever looked at a forestry mulcher? Those cost more than the tractor. Mm. Mm-hmm. Dang. Yep. I don't know. Rent it. Rent it out. <laughs> I got your tool library with it. There's yep. there you go. <laughs> There's your business. I can't, I can't imagine the the liability insurance you'd have to get with trying to rent a forestry mulcher. Right. I know. Yeah. I can't imagine. Sign, sign you gotta sign your life away before you rent it. Or even just the liability insurance for one if you did it as a as a contractor and you went to people's houses. Like, what's your what's your insurance policy got to be on that? I don't know, but you can make your money back pretty quick. If you, it's true. <laughs> if you worked, you'd be yep. on that thing all day. You have to be. They make one that that grinds rocks just like that. I'm like, that's what I need for our wow. property. That would they, be impressive. They, make, they turn them into gravel. 
So like a rock grinder, kind of like a stump grinder, but for rocks. And like wow. between like yeah, like maybe someday I'll get one of those in the homestead, and we can turn a lot more of these areas into nicer pasture than have some gravel to go with it too. But yeah, because that mulch, two mulcher guys that I hired, there were some rocks that were like, yeah, we can't go that way. Yep. <laughs> I mean, you could see the sparks as it was going. So I think that might have been it for me. Um, Did you sleep good after? Oh, yeah. All of us. <laughs> All of us. You know, it's pretty amazing, though, you know, seeing our daughter. I mean, she's doing some manual labor lately. <laughs> you like seeing her, like, grow up, you know. After we, you know, we moved here, she was four. And now seeing her now, it's just kind of. You know, sometimes you'll, it catches you, you know, you like, you're like, you know, just happen to like, just notice and you're like, wait a minute. She's like almost an adult. <laughs> like she's doing like we had, a, you know, we pulled the, pulled the, the greenhouse plastic over to the high tunnel. Like she's in there, you know, with the rope pulling and I'm like, man, like she's getting it done over here. And like, she's, you know, hauling soil and stuff. She's driving the mini truck. So it's, it's pretty cool to to see that you know yep. time, time flies right. <laughs> time flies when you're having fun i guess so does the future of feeding the u.s need small farmers do we need small farmers or ranchers to do any of that or are they the answer are they the answer to that there's a lot of stuff going around i think we see saw it during covid with all like the breakdown of the food chain system and but i think even more and more we're seeing a lot of it and like just i don't know you're seeing all the droughts you're seeing all the sh different shortages and stuff. The weather patterns are getting crazier. It doesn't make it easier. No, but it At would all. diversify everything. I guess what got me thinking is all the crazy stuff going on because there's been a bunch of forest fires lately. If you had a bunch of small farms, ranches, it would diversify a lot of stuff. And if something happened to a farm or a couple of farms or a region, would it be less of an impact versus if one ha if something happens to one of those huge feedlots so like a big feedlot went down or you know you got hit with a catastrophic weather or something how much would that hurt versus a bunch of small farms in an area going out the way i feel about it like the answer to that that question is yes and uh yes uh we need small farms and ranches and stuff like that and uh honestly the way i feel about it if you think about like back when we were in California, if every single person in a neighborhood grew a garden, because, I mean, we had it with our neighbor, our neighbor Leonard, uh, he would grow stuff that we wouldn't grow and we would grow stuff that he didn't grow. And when he's drowning in squash, we're drowning in tomatoes. And when, you know, he's he's needing cucumbers, we're needing, you know, so on and so forth. And thinking about if everybody on that street was growing just just a small garden the abundance if you know you got to have a good relationship with everybody on the street but the abundance that you can just build up just by sharing your vegetables uh now if you like if you take that and you go even farther and you go into small farms like right now we're growing our food um with the intention of we want to be able to grow our food's food and just the past couple of years that we've been trying to do this, it's a big undertaking. But I feel that we have not even scratched the surface on how much food we can grow on this seven acres. Uh, if it got to where there was no feed store anymore, something catastrophic happened, or like we're seeing, we just ordered feed the other day. Feed is astronomically high right now. Like we're nearing the point where we're going to have to change something or get less animals because it's it's ridiculous we have absolutely traded a food budget for a feed budget uh because you know it's it's just it keeps climbing and every year it's going up and up and up you know the price of fuel the price of you know out in the the rest of the country it's just like al said you have droughts you have fires you have these horrible things extreme weather you have all of the uh, the fires, the random random fires that have happened at various food processing plants and 
places like that. Uh, it's just, it's weird. It's weird that it's all happening at the same time. You know, I don't know if uh, you guys want me to put on my tinfoil hat, but we can talk about it. Uh, it's <laughs> it's kind of weird. That nowadays, it, <laughs> it all winds up. <laughs> yep. You just, yeah, you all just it takes is just a little. Yeah, you just have to pay attention. Uh, right. Uh, if anybody is unwilling to s make the – I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a coincidence theorist. <laughs> well, I don't yeah. really think you got to be a coincidence there. You just got to have your eyeballs open. Like if you talk about the crazy weather patterns, people think that chemtrails are crazy. Go look out in your sky and watch some planes and look at those planes and see what's coming out behind them. That's all you got to say. Like, okay, I don't, well, yeah, we have stuff going on in that world, but you can't tell me it's global warming when they get all those jets out every day spraying. And who knows what yep. they're spraying and how much fuel they're running every day just to spray whatever they're spraying. Uh, getting into that don't... subject, that, that's, that's, a, that's a whole another conversation we could have. <laughs> maybe, maybe we can do that conversation in one of these days, but it's Before we had point... the conversation. I just want people to look like what I think is crazy. I'm sure you guys know this too. If, if you watch YouTube and you're looking at other people's yards, you're, you're seeing it everywhere all yes. the time. Yep. It's like, does the average person not see this? Are they not like, that's not a cloud. That's a streak of gray going, going through the sky. I usually take some picture and post it on my Instagram stories. Yep. If you want to get a lot of people commenting on your Instagram, do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, oh, that's a funny cloud, and just take a picture of it and like just post it. Don't say anything. <laughs> With your flying post it on, on, on your stories. Yeah, they'd be like, oh my gosh, you know, the people start like we're like messaging me. <laughs> the thing that gets me is when they fly in formation, and it's like four planes flying across the sky in a formation, and then no, uh, you know a few hours later, there's another one crisscrossing, and yep. all the, the trails like turn X. into a checkerboard in the sky. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like. You know, I think what's funny is where we are at. I know like what airports are around the main flights, the commercial flights that happen every single day, like clockwork are from Asheville to Charlotte, Charlotte to Asheville. And they kind of, you know, they fly on either side of us. Uh, and then occasionally you'll see ones uh, flying from due north of us kind of to the south, uh, south east. I assume that's to Atlanta. The commercial flights, you can see the emblems on the on the tails. You can tell those are commercial planes. They've got windows. They've got, like, they're very distinct. They're colored. And they are flying the exact same flight path every single day. Uh, we won't see the, uh, the planes in the sky crisscrossing, um, flying the same path every day. One day they'll be here. The next day they'll be over here. Uh, I mean, you can't tell me that that's commercial flights. I'm sorry. Like, it would be every Top single gun, day. Man. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be every single day. Like, Top it would. And then two so, days later, it rains. Yep. So with all those things happening that we said, like, <laughs> you know, Texas burning. And I wonder, let's bring it back to the topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wonder if it would be... Um, I mean, I'm sure it has already, but like open people's eyes to what if it, you know, it was more small farmers than, you know, the giant yep. people, you know what I mean? Like if it was more spread out, I think that's what you said, Ben, if it was, if it was more spread out, um, instead of relying on one central location, because what if it does, yeah, what if it does all burn down, then what? And a lot of it's Chinese owned nowadays, which is or even a foreign country owned is pretty scary, especially if they own the meat packers and stuff. So mm -hmm. I guess questions put out there, people get people to think about how do you bring the food processing back local? Because I think that's the big thing for meat. That's the big hiccup for meat is there's not local processors that are USDA inspected where you can sell your meat by package very easily. And the ones that are around, are pretty well booked up year, usually like a year in advance. Yep. So that's like, I think the big hurdle that needs attention. We're and trying to navigate through that. Right. Like how, yeah. How does one start that? You know, 
Just like we had the question last week, how do we start start a tool library? Like, what are the regulations to that? <laughs> you know, I'm sure there's something right. uh, with anything. Like, how do you navigate to that? But I mean, I'm sure there's ways. You one just thing I remember, I wish I could remember what podcast I heard. And I was somebody was talking about the weight. But one of the first ways you could go around that is if your grocery stores had were butchers again, because then they could just buy a whole cow that was processed and they could do all the butchering in house like they used to do back in the day. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's pretty, pretty simple, but I guess, I don't know. I guess it's just the different things we need to think about to get there. Or, someday. or since they're butchering at the grocery store, I can bring my cow over there. <laughs> well, I think th they wouldn't do that part. They would have the butcher just bring a hanging cow. And then from no, there, I know, but, I'm right. just saying, like, what if they offered that too? Right. You could bring you could bring the carcass. Yeah. No, that's I don't know where I'm at with it. Maybe I'm too DIY when it comes to that. Like, there is a reason I've learned to cut meat. And it's because mm -hmm. oh, yeah. like I don't trust the system to always be there. I like being able to do it. I don't know. Uh doing these classes, like I learned. And I've had so many people ask, you know, teach me that kind of thing. And when we did classes this year, I really feel like I got kind of a, a taste of your average people. Uh, we had a wide variety of people that think like this. They, they feel like us. They, uh, they're, whether or not they're going to start processing their own meat they at least want to know how it's that that saying, if you're not going to shoot, at least carry bullets. Uh, it's better to know how to do it and not need it than to need to know how to do it and have no clue. So I, I think that's just part of shortening the food chain, you know, for shorten your supply line. Do you ever think there'd be a day that you could sell to your neighbor the meat you butcher without having to go through huge regulations? <laughs> like, See, I wonder... like, what are you going to do? Like if, if everything goes to pot and nobody can get meat, absolutely. The black market is going to pick back up. Like there's already a black market now, uh, whether people want to talk about it or not, anything you do that is, you know, traded for or off the books or something that's black market. And if you can't get your meat, all that's available is, you know, lab grown meat or whatever, Absolutely, there's going to be some some. Uh, hey, man, I got a I got a cool trailer over here. Uh, I got some deer meat. If you want some deer meat, you know nobody knows about it. Door to door. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not encouraging people to break the law, but I do believe there's a lot of, as Billy would say, unjust laws. Oh, tons. Yep. So the Meat Inspection Act, I just Googled it, has been in effect since 1906. You can thank Teddy Roosevelt for that one. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I think it's wild. It's over in England. I think it's only the farmers can shoot the, shoot the deer. I don't know. But over in England, they can shoot deer, and then they can sell the meat to restaurants and to butcher shops, and they can sell it. But over here in the U.S., you can't. I found that interesting when I found that out. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, I think what's weird, we have we have some friends who have a deer shop and the uh the whole deer meat thing is such a I wouldn't say unregulated, but it's just like there's just a, a big stamp of you can't really sell it. You know, you can have your deer taken and processed, but you can't sell it because, you know, right. whatever. Some some rule from on high. Uh I just think that's kinda kinda frustrating. Now do they have to deal with any inspectors? to do that oh abs absolutely yeah they yeah. they absolutely have to deal with you know it's i want to say they're trying they were trying to get their usda license so they could actually do beef and pork and stuff like yep. that i don't i haven't talked to them in a while i'm not sure where they're at with all that but uh i know it's a, a whole nother set of hoops you have to jump through before you can do that i want to say you have to get a meat right, handler's license do too but do you, do you have to have that to do that for deer? I feel like for some reason you don't need that. Anything. What, USDA? Any kind of inspection. I'd have to ask them. I, uh, I don't know. I'm not 100% on what hoops they have to jump through, so I'd have to ask them. But 
I know there's a whole nother set um, right. when you go from processing deer to processing beef and pigs and stuff like that. It's kind of like how it is here. We can, I think we can sell, we can, we can do chicken. We, it can't be pieces. It can only be whole chickens and we can sell up to 20,000 a year. I think is what the limit is before we, we have to get, you know, inspected and a license and USDA. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know about you, but I'm not really interested in doing 20,000 birds on this property. That's a, lot of birds. That's a lot of birds. Yeah. And you have to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you can't, you're not taking it to a facility and have them do it. Right? Like if you think about doing, say, a thousand birds a month, 12,000 birds a year, just a thousand birds a month, that's 250 birds a week. Uh, we and usually do a about a hundred birds at a whack and that's a long day. Like that's really a long day. What's the price of a poultry whole chicken go for now? Any idea? Cause I've never, I haven't bought one in years. I don't know what the at price is. grocery goes. store? I, I don't know. Uh, say farmer's market. Like is it 25 bucks, 30 bucks? Like an organic grass fed pasture raised or like just a regular? 30. No, grass-fed, pasture-raised, like the way we raise it. If you could do 20 I've seen them for $10 a pound for organic pasture-raised. Oh, wow. Yep. So yeah. we'll say 30 bucks. So, I mean, you could you could make an income off of that. That's six, at 30 bucks a whole chicken, that's 600000 a year. But you got to take in all your feed and everything. It's a lot of I, killing, man. It is. I know you got to have the market, too, if you're going to try to yeah, sell chicken too. like that. Yeah, that, uh, too. The, uh, my, my two oldest boys worked for our friends at the deer shop and they were talking about, they did chicken. Um, and I want to say they were selling pieces. So maybe they got their meat handler's license, but they were talking about how doing the farmer's market, they sold chicken. They couldn't sell the, the wings, the drumsticks, the thighs, but they sold out of breasts and it yep. was just like. That's all anybody wanted to eat. So, I mean, yeah, what are you going to do? And they couldn't move them. Like the there rest. was, there's nobody who wanted them. So I guess it would just depend on your market. Yeah. You got to make it so, yeah, you got to make it so you have enough profit in the breast to make it worth ra raising the whole bird, I guess. Yep. For sure. I think she said she had like 400 pounds of leg quarters that she wow. couldn't sell. That's a lot. It's a lot for one family to eat. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. Now do they raise the birds themselves? Oh yeah. Yeah, they uh their poultry operation is pretty pretty impressive. Well, I, I think Salatin, he does four hundred birds a week. So he probably does twenty thousand for the year Every on Wednesday. Probably does. I I know he's he butchers them some him, him themselves and they take some to the USDA. Okay, so the ones facility. that take to the USDA they can probably sell they online can ship. and ship yeah yeah yep. the ones that they do themselves i think they have to sell it there at their farm store yeah so yeah they got a bunch of interns and stuff so and they how long do they raise birds for every year do you know like when they start and when they stop because they probably don't go year round no they don't go year round i don't know when they stop probably just spring summer yeah maybe early fall that's a lot of birds to catch every week heck yeah that's a bunch you know, with the right equipment and the the right people helping, that's not really that crazy of a day. You know, there's been some people I've I've helped process chicken with, and they've got their system down really well. They're really, really like on the ball, and you can you can burn through a hundred chickens in a couple hours, like n like nothing. Um, and then, you know, it seems like whenever we do it, a hundred chickens takes us like eight to 10 hours. So I don't know. I guess it just depends on the group. I think Joel can, what, eviscerate a chicken in 30 seconds. I believe <laughs> <Something> it. <laughs> <crazy>. Probably. <laughs> so, yeah, so I don't know how we're going to, I don't know. I think these things happening though, it's going to probably open up people's eyes of like, man, we should maybe support small farmers more, you know? I think it depends on the customers too. Like they gotta want it in order for it to happen. Yeah, I think beef's at a at an all time high right now with all the droughts and everything that happened last year. <clears throat> so yeah, my I guess I'd be curious if it went back to local, would the prices not fluctuate as much? 
And would you, if you had a big issue or catastrophic issue, like weather, whatever, drought, if it, if you wouldn't see the ripples so far across the nation, or if different areas would be able to pick up the slack, just being more diversified and having more coverage, I guess. But I think that's something that should happen regardless. Uh, I don't know. I, I think back to, you know, the early days of our country, think back to what are, what are states well known for? Uh, you know, think of <laughs> off the top of your head. What's, uh, what's Wisconsin known for? Cheese. cheese. <laughs> Packers. Oh, cheese. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, when we were traveling the country, we got to see a lot of, um, uh, very, very different types of terrain and climates and stuff like that. And it really surprised me when we got to the Dakotas. Uh, and because their growing season is so short and the weather is kind of rough, especially North Dakota, there's hardly any trees driving across most of that state. But there's farmland up there. And it surprised me. Well, what do they grow? They grow a lot of, you know, grass. They either grow hay or they're growing grain of some kind, you know, a single season crop that they can just get in, get harvested, get done before the cold weather sets in. And then, you know, the further east you go, uh, it becomes greener, less high desert looking, you know, the Great Plains. Um, and you get to these great big fields of grass and stuff like that. And it's like, well, no wonder minnesota and wisconsin no wonder they have been known for you know cheese stuff like that because they can really grow some good grass up here the supply chain aside if you if you switch your supply chain to grow what really does well in your area i mean there's a reason wisconsin is you know known for cheese it's because they could really grow some good cattle up there Really good dairy animals, stuff like that. I don't know. My, I think I lost the the point I was trying to make there. But a, a way to kind of shorten your supply chain is to eat local. Yeah, that's funny. Someone emailed me this week asking if I would ship a cooney cooney and put him in a dog crate and ship him to his house in New Hampshire. That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> this <is> you. <laughs> I mean, I think he was serious because I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to ship a Cooney Cooney. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> like live. He wanted it live so he could butcher it. And I'm like, mm, Wait, what? How... yeah, That's he's like, I know how to butcher. I just, I just think it's a good size for me. And I, you know, it's only going to be me that's eating it. And I just want to try it. And I was like, all right. I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. And he's like, oh, okay, thanks. I thought I'd ask. <laughs> Contact Al. There's a lot of things <laughs> I've been seeing for sale on Facebook, the different farm places for New Hampshire on Facebook. Oh, really? Yeah. They've had it with Coonies. They're like, man, these pigs are taking forever. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's what they do. I think they, a lot of people have been finding on Facebook, they raise them and they're selling the baby piglets off and stuff. But Yeah, we're going to be having some for sale here in a minute if she would have these pigs already. How many did she have last year? <laughs> Uh, seven. Seven. Yeah. I think she had eight, but one died. Yep. Yeah. How big are your litters usually, Ben, on the guineas? Uh, they've actually been getting larger. Um, this last one was, I think we had ten, ten and eight or something like that. Wow. Ten. Oh, no. no it was, uh, ten and six is what it was. That's a lot of pigs to deal with. Mm -hmm. I know. I'm kind of scared. <laughs> I still got those four pig piglets, or they're not piglets anymore. They're teenager pigs. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to save that many pigs next time. And those four you'll keep till fall this coming this year to butcher. Yeah. Yep. yep. So you're going to have a lot of pigs on your farm this summer. I know. Yeah. I'm glad they're coonies though. <laughs> they're pretty they're pretty gentle you know like right. i don't have to worry about them tearing it up i'm gonna end up putting them in the woods i think yep so i can have more room out here so well anything else guys 
think that's about it. I could uh, get a little bit more fired up about this subject and I could go on for another hour, but I'll just leave it. <laughs> yeah. Can always get into it more next week. Actually, yeah. I, I told Meg the subject and she started getting all riled up and she's like, I want to come on the show. So <laughs> maybe we'll if we, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe if we, uh, we do a subject like this, we can, we can get the, the ladies in here and get them all fired up, see what they have to say right. about it. Yeah. <laughs> we we'll all have tinfoil hats on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, that's it. Um, I appreciate everyone listening and, and watching the podcast. We really appreciate it. If you can, if you're listening on iTunes, leave a, a review and comment and give us five stars. And uh, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. And we appreciate everyone listening and watching. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. See you next week. Later. <laughs>